Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in the beautiful constituency of Fort Saskatchewan, Vegreville, and the beautiful town of Mundare. I'm Jackie Armstrong Hominick, the Par Parliamentary Secretary for Ukrainian Refugee Settlement, MLA for Fort Saskatchewan, Vegreville, and the Chair of the Advisory Council on Alberta-Ukraine Relations. I'm a proud Alberta Albertan with Ukrainian roots, and I'm honoured to be the MC for today's important announcement. Today we are being hosted by the dedicated staff and volunteers at the Basilian Fathers Museum, a site of great significance to the Ukrainian community. Founded in 1953 right here in Mundare, this museum began as a permanent home for Ukrainian artifacts collected to preserve Ukrainian culture and religious heritage. I hope that you're able to check out some of the galleries and learn a bit more after this event. Being a proud Ukrainian, and of Ukrainian heritage, I was humbled to be asked by the Premier to serve as a Parliamentary Secretary for Ukrainian Settlement and to be the Chair of the Premier's Task Force on Ukraine. The Task Force members, I want to acknowledge them again, is Premier Ed Stelmak, Carol Skolinski, Kevin Royal, Jen Schmidt-Rempel, Sally Mansour, Vitaly Metlov. These Task Force members dedicated hours of their time and talent all as volunteers. They're hardworking, compassionate people, and they're on the front lines every day providing support to Ukrainian evacuees in many different ways. Having watched the task force devote hours of time and commitment in helping Ukrainian evacuees, I am reminded of the quote by the late Ronald Reagan, who famously said that there is no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. But I do believe in giving credit where it's due, and I would like to recognize all the task force members and all the volunteers for their invaluable contributions. Their expertise and passion to help Ukrainians has been nothing more than incredible. Today marks an exciting day where we, we will build on the historic levels of funding being provided to Ukrainian evacuees and offer even more support. This announcement and many others have come as a result of the recommendations made by the Premier's Task Force, and I couldn't be more excited to invite Premier Danielle Smith up to the podium to share more details. Well, thank you to MLA Hominuk, and thank you all for being here today. The, um, I also want to thank as well, uh, thank Jackie for all the work she's done as Parliamentary Secretary for the for Ukrainian Refugee Settlement, for chairing the Premier's Advisory Task Force on Ukraine, and for all she's done today to make today's announcement a reality. And I'm glad to be here with my colleague, uh, Rajan Sani, who's Minister of Trade, Immigration and Multiculturalism. For over a year now, we've watched the Russian invasion of Ukraine with horror, pain and the overwhelming need to help. So far, over 25,000 Ukrainians have fled Russia's invasion of their homeland, seeking safety in Alberta. And all of us have stepped up as communities and as a province to welcome them and to help them get settled. And we will welcome any evacuees from Ukraine looking for a safe home. Landing in a different country with a different culture and language, no job and no home isn't easy. That's why since last spring, Alberta's government has provided over $28 million to help Ukrainian evacuees find a place to call home, a job that is fulfilling and a place for their families to get settled. With the realities of the invasion, Changing almost daily, so do the needs of Ukrainians coming to Alberta. As a province, we need to meet those challenges head on, ready and willing to help those who need it most. And to ensure that we got this right, I created the Premier's Advisory Task Force on Ukraine to get advice on what supports are the most needed. All of the members of this task force have deep roots in Alberta's Ukrainian community. Jackie Armstrong Hominuk, as I mentioned, is the Parliamentary Secretary for Ukrainian Refugee Settlement, and she chaired the task force. And thanks once again, Jackie, for your leadership and passion in helping your community. Thank you also to Sally Mansour, Kevin Royal, Carol Sloyinsky, Vitaly Malentiev, uh, Jen Schmidt Rempel, and of course, former Premier Ed Stelmak, who is here today. I was delighted to see him for all of your willingness to volunteer and lend uh, your expertise. In just a few short months, 
or in, pardon me, in just two months, these dedicated people engaged with hundreds of Ukrainian community groups, not-for-profits, immigrant-serving agencies, and faith-based communities on the front lines of helping Ukrainian evacuees. The task force learned about the need for additional funding to support language and settlement priorities, emergency, financial, and housing supports, as well as a dedicated streamlined service to meet the emerging needs of evacuees requiring help navigating government programming. They summarized what they heard and provided immediate and long-term recommendations. A heartfelt thank you to everyone on the task force for this tremendous work in such a short period of time. Alberta's government took the recommendations to heart as we looked at the funding allocations in budget 2023 for language and settlement services, housing and financial supports, and steps needed to ensure evacuees could access critical information on the supports available to them. Budget 2023 is helping funding for a centralized help desk that will help evacuees and organizations navigate the resources that are available to them. Minister Sani has more information on the supports in budget 2023 dedicated to assisting evacuees from Ukraine, so I will turn the mic over to her. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here in this glorious setting. Uh, thank you, Premier, and thank you, Honorable Emily armstrong Hominick. And uh, I really want to thank you for your continued leadership on behalf of Ukrainian evacuees in Alberta. We are here today to recognize the important work of the Premier's task force on Ukraine and to share new ways we are providing support to Ukrainian evacuees. As we know, the war in Ukraine continues. And very early into this invasion, Alberta's government knew that we needed to step up and provide Ukrainians a safe and welcoming place to land. Last month, on the first anniversary of the war in Ukraine, this government announced that Budget 2023 would provide $27.3 million to help the evacuees access settlement, language, housing, and financial supports. This funding was vital to ensuring Ukrainian newcomers had access to the supports needed for a successful settlement in our province. Supports that, as temporary residents, they were often not previously eligible for. That announcement was a big step forward for the Ukrainians that have already arrived in Alberta and welcome news for the evacuees that continue to arrive each week, over 26,500 as of March 17th, according to Alberta Health Registrations. Today, we are excited to announce that Budget 2023 would provide an additional $2.1 million in additional supports for Ukrainian evacuees. This funding will assist in the implementation of the recommendations produced by the Premier's Task Force on Ukraine. As the Premier shared, over the past several months, the Task Force was working in the background with numerous organizations to identify ways to help evacuees have a smoother transition into Alberta. The Task Force found two important gaps pre-arrival supports, and navigating and accessing resources once Ukrainians had arrived in Alberta. First, it is important to ensure that evacuees have sufficient pre-arrival supports. Extra help in this area goes a long way to easing the stress of the transition on these families and individuals during an already difficult time. Second, the task force was notified that there were significant barriers to finding out about all of the programs available at each level of government. Many evacuees do not have any family or friends here to help them navigate new information systems, and especially in a new language. The task force recognized that Alberta needs one place that Ukrainians can call and obtain help. From these recommendations from the task force, the helpline concept was de developed. The helpline will assist Ukrainians navigate the broad range of programs and supports available to them. Of course, most importantly, the helpline staff will be providing information in their home languages of Ukrainian and Russian. We are working quickly to get the helpline up and running. This is an important step forward and it will have a real impact on the Ukrainians who are coming to our province during very difficult circumstances. Alberta will continue to support Ukrainians leaving their home country as the war continues by helping them resettle in our province. Because whether they are here for the short term or for the long term, we want them to know that they are welcome. 
Before I conclude, I want to pass along a huge thank you again to Honorable Jackie Armstrong Hominick and Premier Daniel Smith for their continued leadership and dedication in this difficult project during these very difficult times. Thank you all for joining us today. All right, thanks everybody. That concludes our formal portion. We will now move to the media Q&A. Is there any media in the room that have any questions? Yeah, go ahead, name an outlet. Uh, one question, one follow up. Hi, it's David Owasik with CTV News out of Edmonton. Uh, can you tell me what this, is it 2.1 million? Sorry, it was close to that. And what it's earmarked for specifically? Yes, that's correct. In addition to all of the other supports that were announced recently, we're announcing another $2.1 million today dedicated for pre-arrival support. So that could be in the form of webinars or internet services or updated websites that have information on all the supports that are available here in Alberta and also for a helpline. And we're working on that as we speak. Yeah, I have a follow-up. Um, the uh, the helpline is very uh, needed a lot because of when people are arriving here in Alberta, they're unsure of where to go, who to connect with. The helpline will actually connect people with the resources that they need, and it is much needed. So it's a great great uh, announcement, um, uh, Minister. Thank you. As a follow up, you you spoke about the twenty six thousand approximate uh, evacuees since the war began. Do you have an idea that that a, n a number of evacuees are coming in the near future? Is, is there a number that you have? Uh, I don't have an estimate. I know that for the queue at visa, about 600,000 visas were approved. And we have, as you mentioned, over 26,000 uh, Ukrainian uh, temporary residents right now. Um, Jackie, would you have some information on that? Uh, from the information I have, about 24% of the arrivals to Canada are coming here to Alberta. So I, I am expecting, with the people sitting in queue, et cetera, uh, that we'll probably have about 125,000 come to Alberta if the stats stay the same, the percentage stays the same. Okay, anybody else from the media on the floor? Yeah, you can just, the microphone, name and outlet, please. Hi, I'm Michelle with the News Advertiser. Um, I just wanted to know logistically what supports there will be in communities like Mundare and Vegreville to help the new evacuees. I know there were some settlement um, issues and uh, funding to get them kind of uh, relocated, especially in the rural area. So if someone can clarify that. The rural communities are working in conjunction with UCC and uh, a lot of support groups around the province are working together. I know Vegreville Stands with Ukraine has been standing on, on, on its own actually bringing people in. But the choice to come rurally actually lays with the evacuee. They make the decision if they come rural, rurally or not. And I'm saying welcome to rural Alberta. Please, please come to rural Alberta. We want you. Did you have a follow up, Michelle? Okay, anybody else from the floor? All right, operator, can you please put through the first caller? Rick Bell, Calgary Sun. Uh, good morning. Uh, I have a question for the Premier. Um, this morning, there are people protesting in Calgary because they want to take the name of our first Prime Minister, Sir John McDonald, off their school, uh, pointing to um, the stand he took on residential schools. What is your opinion of uh, this um, request by the protesters that the Calgary Board of Education remove the name of Sir John A. Macdonald off a school here in Calgary. We respect the right of local school boards to make their own decisions about how they, they do their naming. I understand that CBE is going through a process on this. And um, we'll have to see what it is that they turn up with at the at the local level. This, uh, it's you know, this is is part of the the, uh, the 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 problem that we have right now is that uh, not all of our prime ministers were perfect people, and I, I think that uh, being able to have a, a, 
a discussion historically about the rights and the wrongs is a is important discussion to have. But uh, as for uh, the issue of naming, we we do leave that to this this Calgary Board of Education on um, what their ultimate decision is there. Rick, do you have a follow up? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the former uh, premier Jason Kenney uh, was very adamant in his. Um, views on uh, removing the name. Um, do you have a personal opinion on this particular issue? I, I, do, I do get concerned about erasing portions of our history um, because I do think it's important that we understand the rights and the wrongs that all of our prime ministers did. It's, it is part of Canadian history. We, we have to look things squarely in the eye when things uh, happen that we wouldn't approve of today, and we have to be willing to talk about it. And I, I think that the, the, the cancellation of some of these historical figures works against that. We, we should have these long conversations, and we should be able to address the, the issues of the past. We've got prime ministers that have been named on buildings and on airports all over this, uh, this country. And so I, I guess that's the question that we have to ask ourselves, is are we going to be cancelling all of them? Um, because of, of, of mistakes that they that they made, that that I think is is a, a broader conversation that we need to have. I think that uh, this particular case of this particular school, as I said, we agree with local control, local decision making, and it will be a decision of the Calgary Board of Education. If people are wanting to weigh in, they should call their trustee. All right, operator, next caller, please. Chris Barco, Calgary Herald. Hi, this is a question for the Premier. Premier, why did your government decide to move now on the issue of unpaid municipal taxes by energy companies and direct the AER to only approve well-licensed transfers or new licenses if companies prove that they paid their civic taxes? Are there other options that your government is also considering to ensure that these taxes are getting paid? One of the things that we had hoped to do when we got elected was that we would put some pressure on the companies now that the oil and gas prices have recovered to pay their unpaid liabilities. We understood that it was somewhere in the order of $250 million. And I know that Minister Rebecca Schultz has been working very hard with the municipalities to identify where the unpaid taxes are, as well as working very hard with uh, the different industry associations to put pressure on their own members. And that resulted in, I believe, 25 companies that were currently operating and in arrears to develop either payment plans or to, to uh, address those arrears to, in the tune of about $45 million. But there are still a number of companies that are, are not rising to our, our request and expectation that they be fully compliant. So I know that Minister Schultz has been working for the last number of months with Minister Pete Guthrie and the Alberta regulator about the way to do this. And uh, we, we, we finally figured out a way to do it that targets those who are going to be the ones who uh, are in arrears as opposed to punishing the vast majority of the industry that is in compliance. So the approach that we are going to take is that we're working with the municipalities so that they can register with us if there is unpaid taxes because they're the ones who have the information. And then we have to figure out what threshold um, has to be met, how high it needs to be before we would say, sorry, you've got, uh, it, it, it get, uh, gets flagged so that the regulator is informed of that. And then the regulator will just say, sorry, as a condition of any well site transfer, you've got to pay up these taxes. It, it, it took a little bit of time to figure out what the process would be. We didn't want to add a bunch of additional steps and a bun bunch of additional processes. And so we're really going to be relying on municipal affairs and we're going to be relying on the municipalities who have the arrears to work with us to identify that so we can assist them in making sure those taxes get collected. It just took a few months for us to be able to come up with the, the, the approach that was going to work. And we did want to try to put some pressure on the companies first to encourage them to do the right thing. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of companies that are out of compliance and so we have to take stronger measures. Chris, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, um, yesterday the federal environment minister called for a stronger federal role in the environmental monitoring and communications within the oil sands. How would you assess how the AER has performed in regards to the problems at the Curl oil sands mine and specifically its notification of First Nations and senior levels of government about the issues? Well, first of all, I'd say that the, the federal government does have a role to play if uh, any contaminants make it to tributaries and to water and there was no impact on drinking water. 
I know that there's been a lot of misinformation, which has led to a lot of confusion and a lot of fear. And I unfortunately think that the environment minister at the federal level himself is responsible for for some of that misinformation. He put out a a tweet that he had to delete because it contained inaccurate information. We have a number of different bodies that are doing the testing, including Imperial, including the environment. Uh, uh, We have the regulator overseeing all of this. We have invited in Indigenous um, communities as well, or the company has invited in Indigenous communities to do their own water testing. The the federal government has uh, requested that we have a a working group to work collaboratively on how on a go forward we deal with the issue of uh, tailings. And, And I welcome that because many of these companies for 20 years have been trying to find a solution uh, regarding federal permitting so that they can treat the water and find a way of disposing of it and they haven't found a willing federal partner so if the federal government is now willing to come to the table so that we can address this issue I, I welcome that I think it's really important because I think that that's one of the lingering issues that we have now that we have a number of the of the projects that are advanced that we've got to we've got to start dealing with this uh, but as for the principal role of regulating this industry It falls to Alberta, and it falls to our Alberta energy regulator. And I have expressed my disappointment that some of the communications was not as clear as it could have been. I think that the company has done a a reasonably good job of of clearing up some of that misinformation. But I think the the real issue that we have is misinformation is is still out there. And that's part of the reason why, unfortunately, the the federal government feels a need to intervene on this. I think my environment minister yesterday said they're trying to distract from the problems that they have in Ottawa. Ottawa on the investigation into Chinese interference in the election. So uh, that's that's her impression of what's happening here. And I want to keep an open mind and I want to make sure we can work collaboratively together. But this is our this is this really does fall to our regulator to make sure that we've got the processes in place and the comms in place. And I'm satisfied that they are working on this. All right, operator, next caller, please. Catherine Gorgowski, Alberta today. Thanks for taking my question. Also on curl, I was hoping to get some clarification because you said there there wasn't that duty to notify, for example, the Northwest Territories because it the the leak did not enter tributaries. But I'm wondering why do you feel that duty only kicks in after the investigation rather than right when the spill happens? Well, I think, look, good practice and being a good neighbor is more communication is better. That's that's going to be our, our approach going forward. I've talked to the environment minister about that and the energy minister about that and the regulator about that. More information is better. If anybody has any, um, mis- uh, if, they're, if they're going to misconstrue what has happened, if there's misinformation, it's our job to make sure that we that we address those issues early on. So we'll we'll be working with the regulator to, and to develop new processes to make sure that any time there's an incident that the comms are clear, that we have radical transparency and and just even as a courtesy, make sure any impacted party has a, a heads up and so that they don't have any fear based on the misinformation that they that they see on social media or in the media. So I think that it's incumbent upon us to just be a good neighbor that way. Catherine, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, so in terms of this working group, um, I, I guess it would be focused on long-term tailings. Can you can you describe how that would be different than the oil sands monitoring program, which is already that joint provincial federal working group with uh, First Nations and Métis participation? Well, I think you've seen Energy Minister Jonathan Wilkinson talk about this as well. The the problem is that um, if you have no way of disposing of the water, then you're just going to end up monitoring and managing. And at some point, it just means that you're building more tailings. And that's not sustainable, and that's not what any of us want. We have to find a mechanism to treat the water and then dispose of it safely. Um, it, all throughout our industry, we have disposal wells for this purpose, deep wells where you're able to dispose of water. We, we, uh, ha- I know that we have a treat and release policy, but the federal government um, does not uh, think that that's an appropriate way of doing this. But we can't just keep building tailings ponds out, and we can't just keep uh, managing and monitoring. We have to find a way to eliminate the uh, water after it has been cleaned um, and, get, and make sure that we're reducing the, uh, the further liability. That's the big problem that we have, is that we, we, we just have to work with our federal government to find out how we're going to be able to uh, ultimately eliminate these tailing ponds altogether. All right, operator, can we go to our last caller, please? Janet French, CBC. 
Hi there. Uh, just to touch on what you were just speaking on, the, the proposal for releasing treated tailings water into the Athabasca, for example, has been under consideration by the feds for quite a while. How palatable do you think that that would be to indigenous communities who who live in, and off the land up there and the general public? Not at all. Like, that's the problem that we have, is that uh, it's been under consideration for 20 years. And we know the federal government is never going to approve that release. So we have to find a solution. So what is an appropriate solution? That's uh, going to be what the conversation is at the table. Um, because I think that this is, uh, this is, we're getting to a point now, because these, uh, these ponds have been in operation for so long, that we need a reasonable solution. We need a water treatment solution. Maybe we need a disposal well solution. Maybe there's another solution that I ha that I haven't considered and don't know about. But the the, the fact of the matter is, if we, if we keep on asking for something that the federal government has clearly indicated they're not going to do, then we're going to be in this constant fight of trying to manage ever-increasing tailings ponds. We've, we, I think we all have uh, an objective of wanting to get the, these tailings ponds um, removed because it is the, the the more you have the the more likelihood that there is that there's going to be an incident an accident we don't want that to happen so we're under active discussion with the federal government you saw from energy minister jonathan wilkinson's comments that he thinks it's time for us to come together to figure out what a what a solution would be and we will be doing the full range of consultation but i think that's why we need to have the two of us together in partnership is because we have to figure out what a long-term solution is here because i i think that uh, the the, uh, the risk of of having uh, some kind of spill that will uh, that that will uh, get into the, the the drinking water is something none of us want to even contemplate. We we want to make sure that we have that we've eliminated that risk. So now it's now is the time for us to figure out what a solution will be. Janet, do you have a follow up? Yep, just pivoting to a totally new topic. On the weekend, you said on your radio show that it was a shame that Justice Russell Brown wouldn't be involved in hearing um, the C69 case before the Supreme Court. But just as Sheila Martin is from Alberta, what does Brown's absence mean for Alberta in this case? I, I hope it doesn't uh, impact, impact the case. And uh, we did have a, a discussion about whether or not we thought that there would be some uh, chance that it, it would skew the outcome. Because we do know that um, Russell Brown has been a minority voice when it's come to things like the carbon tax and defending provincial rights. So we do know that he has a history of taking a very strong view on provincial rights. That being said, we have uh, eight out of ten provinces that are also uh, intervening in this case. Quebec uh, appoints three judges to the Supreme Court, and Quebec judges have been known to be very strong in defending provincial rights as well. So we're prepared to let the process play out. We just think that, especially with the uh, with the lower court ruling four to one, that this is essentially a rewriting of our constitution. It is a devastating um, uh, interjection into provincial jurisdiction, and it essentially uh, gives the federal government carte blanche to make decisions over all of our industrial projects. And we can't allow that to happen. Um, we, we, we know, for instance, that we had some instability in our power grid over the course of this past winter. We, in this province, need to be able to have some reliable power. And the reliable power in this province means natural gas. And we cannot have a federal government that stands in the way of us being able to approve new power infrastructure when we've, when we've already seen an experience of instability. So these are the kind of things, it's getting serious now, that we're beginning to see that there are real impacts and real potential harms. And that is the case that we will be making very strongly to the, uh, to the court. There is a reason why energy development is provincial jurisdiction. There's a reason why electricity development is provincial jurisdiction. is because there are different geographic realities that take place in different parts of the country and different resources that are in different parts of the country. That's why you cannot centrally manage these things from Ottawa. You have to be able to manage them from the seat of power in each of the individual provinces. And I'm pleased to see that seven of our other premiers agree with us, and I'm looking forward to seeing a strong case put forward. All right, thanks everybody.